Welcome to Grace Point Church, Wichita, Kansas. If you've never been here before, welcome to Grace Point Church, Wichita, Kansas. If you've never been here before, it's your first time, I think you'll notice we are not your grandmother's church. <laughs> so, motorcycles in the church. ACDC, rock and roll in the church. Ah, scandalous. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. That's why we're here tonight. A crash course in transforming how you think. And one of the things that uh, Race Point has taught me is to reclaim my music. You know, growing up, I listened to heavy metal. I listened to you know, all those bad boy songs and when I got saved, suddenly I couldn't listen to the music anymore. And so, you know, if it came on the radio, I felt kind of guilty for tapping my foot or singing along. But Grace Point taught me that the, make the music your own. And one day I was driving around and the song came on the radio. And for the first time, I heard it differently. And, and I saw it, literally saw it differently. And... I saw Jesus and the disciples speaking to me. So if you listen to the words of this song, it says it's criminal. There ought to be a law. And isn't that what they did to Jesus? Everything he said, they criminalized. They were trying to, to catch him in, in heresies. They were trying to throw him in prison. They were trying to kill him for these criminal acts. You know, it's criminal. There ought to be a whole lot more. And that's true. If what he did was criminal, then we all need to be criminals. <laughs> we need to shake up society. We need to rattle cages. We need to get people to stop and think that the way they're going about it is, is actually not the right way. He says you get nothing from nothing in the song. And that's you know, what Jesus teaches, is that if you pursue things in the worldly way, you know, you're chasing money, you're chasing the bigger house, the bigger truck, the bigger car, you know, status symbols, and you always end up feeling empty. You always end up wanting something more. And that's what he is saying is, you pursue your, your treasures here on heaven, you got your reward, you're done. You get nothing from nothing. You know, tell me, who can you trust? Jesus said, and God said, that... You know, lean not on your own understanding. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your might, all your soul. Lean not on your own understanding. So, you know, I, I, as I'm listening to the song, as I'm driving along, I'm seeing Jesus standing there saying, so Lance, who are you going to trust? <laughs> Yourself or me? You know, look what your best thought process is. Look what your best decisions have led you to. You know, we got what you want. And as Jesus is saying that, we got what you want. You know, salvation. The peace of God. We have what you have been chasing all this time. And you, you've got the lust. You have a burning, yearning desire inside of you to, to be connected, to be um, in fellowship with the Lord, to feel like you belong to something bigger and higher. That's what you're after. So... If you want blood, if that's what it takes to save your soul, if that's what it takes to, to reconcile you with God so you can have that eternal, personal relationship with Him, you got it. And He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us. But if you've ever seen any of these passion movies lately, <laughs> you, you really begin to get the idea that this was... This was a pretty brutal, horrible, bloody death that, he, sat, that he, he suffered through for us. So if you want blood, blood on the streets, blood on the rocks, blood in the gutter, every last drop. And that's what he gave for us, is every last drop. You got it. And so <clears throat> I'm not here to preach tonight. <laughs> I am, I'm not a preacher. That's Pastor Mike Snow. He does a fantastic job of it every week. And he leads a, a wonderful congregation in teaching people how to transform on a daily basis. 
What I am here tonight is to help you learn to think differently. And, and as I'm thinking differently, suddenly music sounds different to me. And so that's what we're here for tonight, is to learn how to think differently. So let's just start jumping right in. Perspective. What you see is what you see. And when you look at the photo, many of you, when you first glanced at it, you saw a man looking right at you. But some of you, when you first looked at it, you saw a man looking to the left. And now that I mention the other perspective, you're able to now shift back and forth in your mind and see a man looking right at you or see a man looking to your left. And in these next three weeks, that's what I'm hoping to be able to bring to you to help you learn how to do is how to shift your perspective. <clears throat> this stuff I'm teaching, I call it fundamentals, and I'll explain why here in a minute, but these fundamentals, they're, they're born out of what I do for a living. I am a licensed psychologist. I've been practicing for 20 years now. I've worked in prisons. I've worked in corporations. I've worked in private practice. I do a lot of conflict stuff right now, child custody, divorce seminars, or uh, divorce parents. I do the seminar every two weeks at the courthouse. They, uh, when the judges begin to hear the information that I'm going to present to you guys, they ask me to come and present it to parents of children who are going through a divorce because they know how conflictual and how troubling these events can be for those parents. And they wanted, they wanted the parents to be able to have this information, to try to cope better, to try to have better co-parenting relationships. And so this information is, is born out of psychology. And as I, I brought it to the church to begin to teach an anger management class, <laughs> you didn't know that's why you're here, did you? <clears throat> um, Pastor Snow uh, rightfully sat through the first one and it was kind of uh, unnerving because every time I would look over at him, he, he had this real solid blank stare on his face and I couldn't read it. And so finally I asked him, you know, is, is this okay, what I'm doing? And, and he said, there's a lot of good stuff here. And so over the next six, seven months, we talked, and we talked about the material, and we talked about the Bible, and we talked about Jesus, and we began to see how this information is not just useful to you to alleviate depression, to rid yourself of anxiety, to have better relationships with your wife, to have less conflict in your life, to be more successful in your career. And that's what these fundamentals were originally for. This is stuff I use every day in my private practice with people suffering from all sorts of maladies. But he began to open my eyes that if we're not feeling connected with our partner, if we're not feeling connected with ourself, if we're not feeling connected with the last treatment program that we just went through, do we have the tools to feel connected to Jesus? And, and so over these discussions and over time, this is what's come out of this, or these fundamentals, and beginning to apply them, not just to the various areas of your life that, that I deal with on a daily basis, but this is how you can start to have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Jesus, with the Bible. Rather than seeing the Bible as a list of rules, this is all the stuff I can't do, <clears throat> to start to look at the Bible that this is an instruction guide for life. This is where, I want to know what God's plan for me? It's written down in there somewhere. <laughs> but it's up to me to dig into it and start to pull it out and figure it out. The Bible was written for you. And you. It, it wasn't written for them. So if you're reading the Bible and you're thinking about other people, you're, you're disconnecting. But if you will look into the Bible and look into it to get information for yourself, then your eyes will start to be open. And one of the first times that happened, um, Mike and I were in a men's Bible study uh, one Wednesday morning at 6.30, and I happened to open the Bible to Matthew 15, 16, and I started giggling, and everybody in the group said, what? And I said, right here, Jesus says, what are you, stupid? <laughs> And we all kind of got a chuckle out of that. It's in the Bible, huh? And Mike looked at me and said, you know that was written for you and me. 
Touche. And he's right, because it's kind of a, what was happening in, you know, in that passage was right before that, Jesus had been uh, approached by the Pharisees with one of these conundrums that, you know, uh, they're trying to trap him. And his answer to them was just brilliant. And I could just see him giving this answer. Everybody standing there going, oh, he got us. And him walking off and the, his, uh, his followers run up to him and say, what were you talking about? What was that all about? I don't get it. And he looks at him and says, what are you, willfully being stupid? And then he explains it again. And they still don't get it. So he's just like, okay, here's what it is. And he walks off. But what he was trying to tell them had nothing to do with what he was telling them. And that's what I hope to open your eyes to, is it's not a story about an adulterous woman. It's not a story about whether or not to wash your hands before you eat or not to wash your hands before you eat. Through these parables, through these, these teachings of his, he's actually trying to show us how to think differently. So, <clears throat> Perception, uh, one way to kind of understand what perceptions are, perceptions I talk about as being like sunglasses. So if you look up at the ceiling right now, you will get blinded, <laughs> and you'll see a white light. Now, if I took and gave you a pair of sunglasses that had yellow tinting on them, and you put them on, and you looked at the light again, the light would now appear now, real important question, what changed that caused your mental experience of the lights to change? Okay, did reality change? No. But your mental experience changed, whether you're wearing the sunglasses or not. Sunglasses are filters. We have mental filters that we load into our brain, and they are called perceptions. And you know this. I'm not bringing you anything devastatingly new over the next three days. I'm hoping to open your eyes to stuff you already know. How many times have you disagreed with somebody about something and said to them, well, that ain't how I see it? One reality, two different experiences. They're upset, you're happy. You're upset, they're happy. Same reality. That's not how I see it. How you perceive it determines your experience of it. And this is really important to understand. In cognitive behavioral psychology, what we believe, what we operate on, is that you are comprised of three basic components. Thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. A lot of times people come to a psychologist because they want to change how they feel. Well, we can't just change our feelings, you know, feel happy. You can't turn these things on and off like that, but you can change how you think and what you do. And so the way this flows is if I wake up in the morning and I feel, Bleh. I may think, oh, to heck with it, I ain't going to work today, screw that. And I may behave by rolling over and going back to sleep. Now, two hours later, when I wake up again <laughs> and look at the clock, I may think, uh, you really screwed the pooch now. You're so stupid, you went back to sleep instead of getting up and going to work. You're so lazy. Oh, my God. I am judging myself harshly. How am I going to feel about myself as I label myself, as I judge myself? So as I think negative thoughts about myself, I feel even worse than when I woke up in that morning. So now that I'm feeling worse and I'm thinking I'm such a loser, what behaviors are coming to mind right now as I'm laying in bed? You know, stay in bed, roll over. Does this come up on anybody's radar? Golly gee, I better get up and go to work and see my boss. <laughs> How I think, what I feel, brings to mind ways to behave. And if I think a certain way and behave a certain way, I'm gonna create certain feelings. And this is where the perceptions fit in, and this is where I wanna target you guys the most, because all your life, you have been trying to change your behavior 
and you keep ending up back in the same place. You make the New Year's resolutions. Okay, this year I'm going to do this. And your, your wife gets mad at you for something. You say, I promise, I'll stop that. And you, you start forcing yourself to behave differently. You, you want a deeper relationship with Jesus, so you force yourself to come to church. You force yourself to read the Bible. And just changing the behavior is not enough. You don't feel it. You don't feel connected. There's another element here we completely miss, and I think is kind of the whole point of the New Testament, is begin to think differently. Now, you're not going to walk out of here tonight, next week, the week after, and suddenly be a new person. That is not even possible, and that is not the goal of all of this. <clears throat> Paul said, in the Bible, somewhere, Romans 12.2, <laughs> Paul said, transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. Change how you think. Renew your mind. Begin to think differently. You will begin to transform yourself. Why? Why are you doing this? What will you achieve? So we don't always read the second verse. <laughs> we just read the one that's, that's, you know, somebody put on an Instagram and sent around the world, like, transform yourself through the renewing of your mind. Oh, that's beautiful. So that you may begin to discern the perfect will of God for you. Don't you want to know what his plan is for you? Don't you know what God's will is for you? This is how you get it. You begin transforming your mind. <clears throat> Fundamental number one. Don't look at it. <laughs> I like to illustrate it. If I were up here tonight, let's do a little role play. I didn't ride the motorcycle in here. I arrived by vehicle. If I were in here tonight and I suddenly got a little nervous because when that last person opened the door, I saw rain clouds rolling up and I said to you, oh my God, um, I'm sorry, but uh, I left my car window down out in the parking lot, and it's about to rain. Oh, goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, you know what? That's not your problem. I'll shut up about this. Uh, okay, where was I at? Paul something, right? Transform. Uh, was that thunder? Mm. Do, do you hate it when your seats get wet? You know, and you got to sit in them and ride home, and then the next day they smell like milk. Oh, goodness, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Now, if I kept this up for 15 minutes, eventually one of you would tell me to go do what? Y'all sound pretty confident about that. Really? Important question. Seriously think about answering this question. Somebody shout out the answer so I can embarrass you. Why didn't you tell me to go stop the rain? <laughs> you can't control the rain? Does everybody agree with me? You believe this? Even as I challenge you here, you believe you can't control the weather. And because you believe that, it doesn't cross your mind. Is it raining? I better roll up my car window. There are five things in this world you cannot control any more than the rain. The past. You can't change what's already been done. The future. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> How do you undo something that has not occurred? How do you prevent something from happening that has not even taken place? How do you, how do you change something that you can't even predict? You cannot predict the future. Look at the stock market and all these people getting paid lots of money to predict the stock market. And you would think somebody could be able to do it. Research I just read recently said 95% of all stock analysts do worse than the average. <laughs> you cannot predict the future. When you were 18 years old, did you think this is where your life would end up? 
You cannot control the past. You cannot control the future. You cannot control what other people think. How many arguments have you had trying to change their mind? <laughs> you just listen to me. The CIA has tried for years to control thought. It's, as far as we know, it's not working. <laughs> as far as I know. You cannot control what another person does. Am I telling you anything new? Would the jails be filled if we could control behavior? Don't you think we would eliminate one or two crimes? And you cannot control what another person feels. How many sad love songs have been written because she lost that loving feeling. Baby, come back. <laughs> if we could control people's feelings, you know, my ninth grade sweetheart would still love me. <laughs> you cannot control the past, the future, what other people think, what other people do, and what other people feel. And I'm giving the same look I normally get, like, yeah. So, if you believe that, you have to believe the flip side. What do you control? This second in time. Not five seconds ago, not five seconds from now. In this moment, you control yourself. You control what you think and how you think. And that's what this class is going to be about. It's taking control of that. You control what you do. I don't know, I don't know. No, you control what you do. And you control what you feel. You just agreed, I believe I cannot control what another person feels. They're saying the same thing about you. Ain't my fault. They feel that way. Uh -uh. So who controls how you feel? So yes, I am saying, if you are depressed, if you are angry, if you are frustrated, if you are anxious, if you are despondent, if you are whatever, it is your own fault. said to create a memory, and when you leave here tonight, and somebody says, what did that guy talk about? Who said it was all my fault? <laughs> I want you to tell him that. <clears throat> I am trying to shake up your brain, get you to unlock the cobwebs, bring something to you completely different. It is your fault if you're depressed, if you're angry, if you're frustrated. Nobody controls you. And this is the good news. Because if you can create depression, you can create happiness. If you can create anxiety, you can create serenity. If you can create anger, you can create peace. If you can create frustration, you can create patience. It is 100% in your control right here, right now, to experience whatever you want. And what, what dumbfounds me about this is in all the years that I've practiced psychology, I, I don't hear a lot of that in the literature. I don't see a lot of that in the research. I, I see these tools they've given us to help people, but what I hear them talk about is you can't cure depression, you can't cure anxiety, you can only manage it. I'm like, I, mm, mm. I have people who come to me after being with somebody for 15 or 20 years with something that I think, had they approached it differently, they wouldn't have spent the last 10 years suffering. And now these skills apply them 
to your walk. Apply them to your search for a connection. You know, trying to control these things is like trying to stop the rain from falling. You do control the present, what you think and do and feel. And get this, in Proverbs, a person without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Think about that a second. If you don't control you, you are completely vulnerable to attack from outside you. Why are you vulnerable? Why are you suffering? Why are you depressed? Why are you anxious? I know I say it's your fault. <clears throat> you don't know what you don't know. And that's what I hope to bring to you tonight. So when we violate fundamental number one, and here's why I call them fundamentals, and this is how I want you to begin to think about them. But I, I, I heard an interview with Tom Brady. I hate him. Where's that Patriots fan in here? I had immense respect for the man. He is world's greatest quarterback, but he beats my Steelers every time I turn around. But in that interview, they asked him, the world's greatest quarterback, they asked him, what's that little scrap of paper on your clipboard that you had out there before games? And he got all bashful, oh, shucks. And he says, back in college, a quarterback coach came to me and watched me throw the football and then scribbled on this piece of paper and said, these are the four fundamentals to a forward pass. I want you to practice it daily for 30 minutes. So the world's greatest quarterback making multi-millions a year on the eve of the Super Bowl, what is he practicing? Reading the defense and the trick plays? This is what he practices. Make a chicken wing. <laughs> Grip the laces. Come over the top and flick the wrist. And because he focuses on the fundamentals, he can perform the advanced stuff. And so th as I saw this, as I heard this, I got to thinking, I, you know, I think life's kind of like that. I think, I think there's just a few fundamentals. And if we can get those fundamentals down, then maybe the advanced stuff in life starts to become easier. And so fundamental number one, recognizing, now this is what I love, you know, when I, when I have people and I'm working with them and we've gone through this a few times, they come in and they're talking about something they're struggling with and I'm like, oh, what's on number one? This is what they do to me. I know I can't control what they do. What's wrong with that? That's how a lot of y'all are like, like, I know, I, it's all my fault. I point that out, I, I drive that point home to get you out of there. If you can't control that, why are you spending time there? What can you control? That's where you, is it raining? Let me go roll up my car window. Are they doing something? Let me. And so when we are violating fundamental number one, this is some of the things that happen. This should point us back to what we're doing wrong. If we are focusing on the past, we will be experiencing depression, regret, guilt, shame. We point this at ourselves. It's not just the world that we point it at. We may be depressed that my marriage fell apart. Life didn't go the way I wanted it to. This happened to me when I was 12 years old and it shouldn't have happened to me. And I am depressed over all of this. But I pointed at myself, you know, six years ago I did this and oh, I can't believe I did that. Six years before that, I did it then. The future. If you are violating fundamental number one and focusing on the future, you will experience worry, anxiety, fear, trepidation, doubt. If you are not focused in this present moment, if you are living in that future that you're worrying about, this becomes your experience. This is what you are creating. If you are focused on what others think, who here can read minds? I don't see any hands. 
but we will read their mind. Oh, they said that because they think. <laughs> and since they think that, well, I'm going to do this. Well, when this is happening in relationships that I'm working with, I tell the other party, I said, you can go ahead and leave now. Because <laughs> they've got it all worked out for you. Well, they think this and they think that. No, 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 no. Um, you can leave because they already know what you're thinking. So you don't need to be here. Go get a Coke. Can you read other people's minds? Can you predict what another person is going to say, what they're going to do? why they mean certain things. You are creating this in your mind. And this is what you end up doing. If you are focused on what other people are doing, you're going to come across as critical and demanding, controlling, or you're going to feel like what other people are doing is victimizing you, so you are going to be dependent. And, and you're going to be a victim, and you are going to suffer at their hands. If you are focusing on what other people feel, you might be seen as controlling and manipulative or helpless. I've, I learned this in graduate school in the 90s. This was part of the course curriculum to be a psychologist is learning what we control and what we don't control. When they told me I cannot change any of my patients, like, well, why am I here? I didn't get it. It took me some years to figure out I can't control them. Oh my God, that's fantastic. <laughs> because it freed me to help them. This was written down long before I went to graduate school. Matthew, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. He is telling you. First, take the plank out of your eye. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about here? Why are you trying to get that speck out of your brother's eye when you got a big old log in yours? Why don't you get that plank out of your eye? Then you can see better to go after that little speck in your brother's eye. What's he saying? Uh, don't be digging around in your friend's eyeball. <laughs> he is saying, focus on you. This is what you have power over, so focus all your energy on you. <clears throat> fundamental number two, this is how it works. Or, fundamental number two is what leads us to violate fundamental number one. But fundamental number two causes so much more problems than just a violation of fundamental number one. And here's how it works. When I load in a filter called should statements, my reality comes to me through that filter. And so now, by the choice of this filter, I can only have one out of two experiences. So, when I say they should, I load this filter in. It's got cousins, must, have to, need to, gotta, supposed to. The words in and themselves are not bad, but these are clues to how we are thinking. So if I hear myself saying they should, or I'm thinking, you know what, they need to just back off. <laughs> you know, oh, they got to start acting right. These are telling me that I have loaded a perceptual process into my brain, a mental filter called should statements. <laughs> I wish it was more technical than that, <laughs> but that's what it's called. So now that I've loaded this filter into my brain, I am choosing to perceive the world through this lens. I can only have one out of two experiences. If somebody is not doing what they are supposed to be doing, I feel angry. And you, you can't hardly say it without, <clears throat> they should be here by now. <laughs> Now, 
when they are doing what they need to be doing and, and how they're supposed to act, how do you feel? No. Who said good? Meet me after class. You experience nothing. 99% of the time. <clears throat> nothing. Perfect example, you're driving down the road, you hit a pothole, boom, and you think, man, said you should fix that. <clears throat> should. They should maintain the roads. They're not, you're frustrated. <clears throat> I'm gonna write a letter. When was the last time you went an entire city block and not hit a single pothole and got out of your car and said, that is a damn fine stretch of road right there. <laughs> Will you look at that? It's smooth. How are you coming to write a letter? <laughs> so much of your life is governed by this filter. What people should be doing, how they should be acting, what they should be saying, what they should be thinking. And you don't know it until they break the rules. You arrive, the doors are open, the carpets are clean, the chairs are all sitting facing the stage and not in little circles like we're gonna have some big kumbaya <laughs> that make you happy. I told them, put the chairs down so they face the stage. Well, now you know, are you happy that your chair is facing the stage and not facing that wall? So even when you are aware other people are doing what they should be doing, <laughs> you don't care. Look, I wore socks today. So? And you point it at yourself. Oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. <clears throat> you beat yourself up. Oh, I shouldn't have acted that way. I feel so horrible. How many of you are happy when you do what you should? You drive with your hands at 10 and 2. You observe the speed limit. You stopped at the red light. You walked in here. You didn't dance your way in here. You are sitting in your chair. You're not up on the back of the chair. Do these things make you happy about your life? Look, I've got good posture, as I said. <laughs> when you do what you're supposed to do, even when you're aware you are doing it, it doesn't make you feel good. I should go to work. <sighs> I'm not happy I'm going to work. i got to go to work. Where is happiness? Where is joy? Where is appreciation? It does not exist after a should statement. The world is coming at you, going through this filter that you have loaded in, when you said, you know, by God, they should, fill in the blank. I should read my Bible 12 times a day. Are you happy you're reading Bible 12 times a day? No. Probably really mad because you're also thinking, I shouldn't have to do this. <laughs> <clears throat> I should go to church. You feel connected to God when you walk in the door like that? Oh, I got to be here. My wife told me I had to go. And you, you cry out. You're like, oh, what do I do? I don't feel good. I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like Jesus is listening to me. Well, maybe I should go up to church more. Maybe I should go help the homeless. Maybe I should. After a should, you cannot feel happy. It is not in the equation. That mental filter prevents anything else from happening other than frustration or nothing. Now, there is something that you mistake for happiness. It's called relief. If I come out there and squeeze your arm for five minutes, you're going to begin to feel pressure. <laughs> and then when I let go, you will go, oh, thank you so much. Oh, I feel so much better. What just happened? You went 
from a neutral state to pressure back to a neutral state. And you're saying, thank you, this feels so much better. And we do this all day long. That guy better not pull it. He better not pull it. He better not pull it. Oh, he didn't pull in. Huh, this, uh, that's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> From neutral to pressure, back to neutral. Who created the pressure? When I thought, they better not pull in here. I create my own pressure and then I get relieved of my pressure and I interpret that as being good. Oh my God, I got that thing tonight. I got to get out of here. I got to get all this stuff done before five so I can leave. Oh, and I run around, I get it all done. Woo, man, I feel so good now. Ah, I'll be able to go. You don't feel good. That is what I'm trying to tell you. That is worldly thinking. You should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you should have this much money, you should have this kind of house, you should have this kind of truck, your car, you've had it for three years, yeah, you should really turn that in, you should trade it in, you should get something nicer. You should treat your wife better, you should treat your kids better, you know, you should eat here, you should eat there. You're chasing happiness in a manner that prevents you from ever experiencing happiness. And so you have moments of relief from the pressure you put on yourself, and you interpret that as somehow as being happy. And then when you turn 45 or 50, you end up in my office talking about the rat race you're stuck in. I go to work, I get all this money, I turn around, I hand it to all these guys with the bills, and I just sit there in my living room watching TV. I think I'm gonna step out of the middle and tell my employer and Visa, here you go. <clears throat> I used to work with a financial advisory company. About 50,000 employees nationwide and they had to call my office, me, um, a couple of other doctors, to get access to healthcare. And we would triage what was going on for them, try to help them in that moment they're on the phone and then plug them in with the provider in their town. And I heard the same story every day. Dr. Parker, I came over from a company, I was only making 40,000 a year, they promised me 50,000 the first year, I'm on a $30,000 salary, and I've gotta go on commission my second year, and I need 55,000 a year just to pay my bills, and I don't know how I'm gonna do it next year when this thing happens. Ah, la, 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 la. If I could just make 60,000 a year, I'd be doing okay, I'd feel so much better. Next year, what was that phone call like? Dr. Parker, I've been working really hard. I got off commission. I'm doing okay. I mean, I got off the salary. I'm doing okay on commission, and <clears throat> I'm, but I'm only pulling in seventy-five thousand, and I've got this bill, and I got that bill, and then the kids had to get braces, and I, 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 if I could just get it up to eighty-five thousand, I'd be so much. I'd be so okay. And the third year, and the fourth year, and and the the number kept moving till their sixth, seventh year. I literally had phone calls with people complaining and feeling depressed and stressed and anxious and their marriages are falling apart because they only make 160,000 a year and they got this lake house and they got this and they got that. And these are the people you envy. These are the people driving the big cars, eating at the nice restaurant, got the nice haircuts and the thousand dollar suits and you're like, well, why can't I be like that? You're chasing a dream in the world and you will never achieve it. Fundamental number one says you can't control past, future, what other people do, think, or feel. You can control what you think, do, and feel in this moment. But you are choosing to think in a manner that gives control to the world, gives control to the past, gives control to the future, If the past is controlling you, if other people are controlling you, who decides what is right and wrong? Do you? How many times have you heard this conversation? I don't know what I should do. I talked to Mary, and she said I should do this, but I don't know if I want to do that. So I talked to Martha, and she said I should do this. And then I talked to John, and then I talked to my pastor. Oh my God, what he told me I should do. And then they walk into my office and they tell me all the different people they've spoken to who have told them what they should do. 
and I don't know if that's right. What do you think I should do? <laughs> What's missing in that equation? <clears throat> the third problem with shoulds, first of all, only creates a negative experience. No happiness, no joy, no satisfaction. Second problem is it gives away control to other people. If I had an armload of boxes up here, and I'm thinking, I gotta get out that door. I don't know if I can open it by myself when I got all these boxes in my arm. You know, one of these guys should help me out. <laughs> when I get back there to that door and none of y'all move, how am I gonna feel? Fine, sit there. <laughs> I'll get the door myself. <laughs> now think about it. You open the door, I'm okay. You don't open the door, I'm upset. How did you get control over me when fundamental number one says that's impossible? Give the man a cookie. I gave it to you. You're not allowing you are giving it. Allowing means I offer it to you. You have to acknowledge that offer, reach out and take it. If I give you something, you can be asleep and just <laughs> leave it on your front porch. You don't even know. When I think you should do something, my radar is on you. I'm watching you. I'm looking at your eyes. I'm checking out your movement. Are you, are you noticing? Are you thinking? Are you getting up? Are you moving that direction? I am studying you. You are in control of me. And when I get to that door and you don't open it, and I will tell the world about my zaniness. I will tell the world how crazy I am. Why are you so mad? They wouldn't open the door. Don't blame me. It's their fault. Are you getting it? Do you not do this all day long, every day? Blame the traffic, blame the weather, blame your spouse, blame the past, blame. <sighs> I wouldn't be like this if that didn't happen to me when you're giving away control. And then because you have given control outside of yourself, you then look outside yourself to satisfy what's inside yourself and it cannot happen. It is impossible. The third problem creates resentments. <clears throat> the moment you don't open that door for me, moves into the past. One second ago, you didn't open the door for me. I think about it in the present. And I say to myself, he should have opened the door. So in the present, I experience the frustration of you not opening that door one second ago in the past. Two seconds ago, you didn't open the door. In the present, I think he should have opened the door. So in the present, I experience the frustration of you not opening that door two seconds in the past, two seconds, two minutes, two hours, two days, two weeks. Time is irrelevant. I will see you next week. And I, that son of a bitch should open the door for me. <laughs> I was standing on the fourth floor of the courthouse. All these... <clears throat> Somebody knows. <laughs> they call it the love floor. <laughs> That's where all the divorce action happens. I was standing there waiting my turn to go testify in trial. <clears throat> and this lady was standing next to me. And suddenly she had a conniption fit. She's like, oh, here we go. What's wrong? It's that lady said this about me. I won't repeat it. Wow, that's horrible. And I looked at the lady and I recognized her. I'm like, well, that lady retired from the courthouse three years ago. W when did she say this about you? Twelve years ago. <laughs> In the present, I think, she shouldn't have said that about me 12 minutes, 12 hours, 12 years ago. In the present, I experienced the frustration and the anger. 
I build resentments. I beat myself up. We point this at ourselves. Lance, you should really never have dropped out of high school. Oh, I can't believe I dropped out of high school. What was I thinking? I'm so stupid. When was that? 20 years ago. I shouldn't have done this. Because this is what happens. This, you know, look, if you look at these experiences as blips on a radar, when you don't do what you're supposed to do, ding, I experience it. But when you do what you're supposed to do, so what? No emotional experience. And then you don't do what you're supposed to do, beep. And then you do what you're supposed to do, no emotional experience. So when I look to the past, what am I going to see? Every time you failed to do what you're supposed to do. And because in the present I am thinking, they shouldn't have said this, and they shouldn't have done that, and they shouldn't have gone out with them people, and they just, in the present, I experience the frustration and anger of all of these violations all at one moment. Now. And I leave you. I can't leave myself. So when I look back to the past and see all my failures, what I should have done and shouldn't have done, I get more and more depressed. Fundamental number two. Should equals laws. <clears throat> what do you do? I have thoroughly beat you up, dogged you. You know you do this every second of every day. So what do you do? Whenever you hear yourself think, should, must, have to, need to, God is supposed to. That's why I wrote it down. You don't have to memorize it. When you hear your partner say, should, must, have to, need to, God is supposed to. <laughs> Raise your hand gently and ask this question. Is it a law? Can I have them thrown in jail? Can I have them fired? Every time you think they should, or I should, or they shouldn't, they need to get their butt in here right now. Is that a law? Now, if the answer is yes, Keep it. People should drive on their side of the road. I'm heading down the highway. Okay, stay on your side of the road. They should do that. Is that a law? Yes. Okay, what do you do when somebody's breaking a law? Do I have the right to chase them down, get in front of them, slam on my brakes, teach them a lesson? I'll bring in business cards next week if any of you thought yes. I'd have people say yes. <laughs> if somebody is not doing what they should in traffic, then you should call 911. If it is a law, there's a legal remedy. If the guy doesn't serve you the food you ordered at McDonald's, you have a right to slap him around, <laughs> humiliate him. Listen here. No, you're supposed to show them the receipt, try to work it out, call the manager out, and if that doesn't work, do you now have the right to go throw the straws all over the store? You go home, you write a letter to the corporation, include your receipt. Six months from now, you get your coupon. If it is a law, there is a legal remedy. But if the answer is no, People should open the door for me. Is that a law? Nope. Can I have you arrested? Nope. So, change how you think. Load in a new filter. Take this one off. This ain't a should, so I'm not going to look at it that way. This is a preference. I would like you to open the door. I would appreciate it if you opened the door. It would be nice if you opened the door. I could use a lot of help right now. I would love it if somebody opened the door for me. And now that I am thinking this way, you know, it would be great if somebody helped me out. And I start heading towards the door. What might I do right here? 
Oh my goodness. Oh. What? Ask. How easy did that come to your brain? Notice how you think brings to mind options on what to do. Let's back that up a minute. By God, somebody better open that damn door for me. Am I going to ask? How many times you heard this? I shouldn't have to ask. They should know. When I load this filter in, certain behaviors rise up. When I load a different filter in, certain behaviors rise up. As I control what I think and what I do, I create my own experience. So I'm thinking, it'd be nice if somebody opened the door for me. Hey, would you get the door? And you say, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, whatever. I'm being silly, but notice. Hey, will you get the door? No. Okay. <laughs> What's my experience? Hey, you get the door? No. Notice I move away from you. Why am I moving away? Because you don't control me. Hey, you get the door? No. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. I, I, I can't read your mind. I don't know what you're thinking. I really don't want to know. I don't know what's going on over there. Whatever. My emotional experience. <laughs> okay. Disappointment. Oh, my God. i got to open the door myself. Which is what I would have done if you weren't here anyway. Now, if I'm thinking you should open that door, I shouldn't have to ask. <clears throat> Will you get the door for me, please? No. What? <laughs> Notice which way I move now. Hey, get the door. No. What? <laughs> I am pulled towards you. I handcuff myself to you. Get the door. No. What? <clears throat> Get the door. Don't you understand? I can't get the door without you. Now I'm trying to change how you think. I'm trying to change what you do. Why? Because I'm pissed off. Whose fault is that? Yours. You are making me mad. You need to get up. Get the door so I can get out of here. Oh. <sighs> Tell me you haven't done this 12 times today. <laughs> and when I get to my truck and I throw my stuff in the back of the truck and I drive through the parking lot peeling out and, and when I get to the bar tonight, that son of a gun wouldn't open the door for me. Can you believe that? I had all these boxes. They wouldn't open the door. Something in the past is controlling me in the present. Who is creating all of these experiences. And it starts with the instant. There is data coming at me. I receive that data visually, auditory. I receive that data. And the first thing it does when it hits my brain is it gets perceived. From that moment, I then begin to process it and think about it. And that's where I'm running into trouble is because I know what the Bible tells me to do, but I don't feel like doing it. They should be doing this. I shouldn't have to do that. To experience grace is to understand that it is completely up to you. It is your choice. There's a parable in the Bible about Martha and Mary. Anybody ever hear this one? Martha and Mary. Jesus is traveling. He comes to this town and he stops by the house of Martha and Mary. Martha Oh my God, Jesus is here. We got to get this place cleaned up. <laughs> we got to get some food set out. We got to clean the toilet. No one's going in there yet. 
She's running around getting all the preparations made. What's Mary doing? She's like, oh my God, Jesus is here. I want to hear what he has to say. Ah. Right? And Martha, she sees all of this. She's in there doing all this work. Mary's sitting in the living room. And she comes out. Think about what happens next. She comes out and says, Lord, <laughs> I'm in there doing all the work while she's out here doing nothing. You tell her to get in here and help me. Think about this. She knew who he was. This is God sitting in her living room on her couch. And she has the audacity to tell him <laughs> what he should be doing. Tell me you haven't done that. Mm. And when he doesn't do what you think he should do, when he doesn't handle the things the way you think he should or should have, what does Jesus say to her? This is what I mean. It's hard to read the Bible from a should perspective because you're now listening to the story. Well, what should I do? How should I handle this? Is it a law? No. Okay, what do I want? How do I want things to be? What would I like to see happen here? Jesus says, Martha, <laughs> you upset yourself. You're stressing about so much, and there's actually only a few things that are actually, what? Needed. Should, must, have to, need to, gotta, supposed to. There's very few things that are needed. Actually, <clears throat> just one. <laughs> Mary has chosen what is better. Martha's doing what she thinks she should be doing, and she is also thinking Mary's not doing what she should be doing, needs to be doing. And that puts her at complete odds and in conflict and disconnected from God, sitting in her living room. Very few things that are needed. So you challenge yourself every time you say, should, must, have to, need to, God is supposed to. Is this a law? And if it is, obey it. What did Jesus say about laws? Whose face is on the coin? Render under Caesar what is Caesar's. Render under God what is God's. But if you can't honestly answer that question, and this is a law, this is a reason to fire somebody, this is a reason to have them arrested, change how you think. Free yourself. No. This, I, just, I want. I want somebody to help me out. I want them to open the door. That would be so nice. And when I think that way, look what happens. Hey, I might ask. <laughs> and I ask you, hey, would you get the door? Sure. <sighs> what experience did I just have? Happy. Who created it? Jesus. Here is a moment where I could create frustration and anger or I can create happiness. What am I going to choose to create and my choice is coming at a point that you have never really entertained as being something you had power over. How you perceive what is happening around you. And one of the most fundamental places that all our conflict, I deal with divorced people all day long. Child custody stuff, they fight over things you would laugh about, but it's, to them it is not funny. Because they shouldn't have done this, and they shouldn't have done that. And three years ago, they shouldn't have done this, and I'm not going to let them get away with it again. They shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Drives them into my office. I give them this information. <laughs> it's not like I'm trying to get a bunch of business. I'm like, you know, if you think about this a little bit differently, you might feel a little bit differently, and then you might respond to her a little bit differently. The hell with that. <laughs> I shouldn't have to change. <laughs> 
And so what we end up doing in this, because you're going to walk out of here and you're going to say to your partner, you're going to say to yourself, you're going to say, oh, so I should do this. Ah, oh, I shouldn't say should. Oh. <laughs> right there. Now the snake is eating its own tail. <laughs> I shouldn't say should. Ooh. What do you want? Most important question ever. Think I'm lying? The Last Supper? Anybody remember that? <clears throat> Seen the movie? And I saw the movie. <laughs> I've read the Bible, you know, yeah, here we go. But when I saw the movie, and there's a movie on YouTube, The Gospel of John, and it's a great movie, and it is the book of John, word for word, made into a movie. And it just brings it to life. It's so amazing to see the words lifted up. You know, Jesus performed miracles and moved on. Well, okay. But to see him performing a miracle, is like, wow. And so in, something happened. I watched it. I'm like, what? So I watched it again. Like, no, this has got to be a movie thing. And I watched it a third time. I'm like, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I took a big risk, and I came and, and asked my pastor, Mike Snow, so if you've got any problems with this. <laughs> but think about it a minute. This, it may not be exactly correct, but sitting at the Last Supper, he gets the vision. <clears throat> I'm going to die. Is time. You know, up until now, it's not time, it's not time, it's not time. Boom. Sees it. I mean, it's time. And he tells them all this wonderful stuff. He's like, this is the last time we'll be together. What? Where I go, you cannot go. What? What are you talking about? Where are you going that we can't go? I mean, we follow you all this time. They don't get it. From the time they finish dinner, and they're out walking through the garden, and the Romans come and arrest them. From the time dinner until he's arrested. But how long is that? A few hours? That happens that night. So it's not that long. So I heard something in there, and it, it kind of came to me. And I want you to kind of think about this. If you were told today that in a couple of days you're going to be dead, you got cancer, we can't do anything about it, you're going to die. Go home, make your peace. What are you going to tell your children in those last two days? If you've only got a few hours, what are you going to tell them in those last moments? You need to get a haircut and get a job. <laughs> no. You're going to tell them what's most important. The, what you want them to remember. Son, when you grow into a, be a young man, I want you to know. Right? What comes out of your mouth at that moment? All the silliness is going to wash away. It's going to be the most important thing you can think of. Between the time of dinner and the time he's arrested, Jesus said one thing five times. I went and counted it in the scriptures. I came and asked Mike, is that really what I'm seeing? Am I seeing? He's like, yeah. So if he says it five times on his way to death, don't you think it's kind of important? Don't you think he wants us to know it? Five times he said, ask my father for anything in my name. Whatever you want ask for and it shall be yours and throughout the new testament you keep coming back to that over and over and over what do you want what do you want what do you want and we look right past it okay what do i do what should i do i want this gray stuff they keep talking about how do i have to behave in order to get that here's the party come on in how much <laughs> it's free uh yeah, well should i sweep the floor no just come on in here um <clears throat> Well, should I go and help people park their car? No, get in here. Come on. The pool's open. Have fun. Well, you know, I've really got to do something. To... We worldly think in terms of should and must have to. That is what we have been taught. You work for what you earn. 
You, you deserve what you... what you have earned. And you should be this way, and you should be that way, and you should strive for the better pickup, and you should drive for... And so, when we turn to the Bible, this is how we are perceiving it. We're looking for that list of rules, what we got to do, and the crazy thing is we do it ourselves a little bit, we beat ourselves up a little bit, but we will whoop this stuff out on other people. You know, they shouldn't be acting like that. That ain't... That ain't scriptural. That ain't what God said, dude. It says, do unto others as you do unto others. I'm going to do back to them. Apparently that's what they want. (laughs) What do you want? What do you want? Fundamental number one. I don't control the past, the future, what other people think, do, or feel. I do control in this moment what I am thinking, how I am thinking. I'm impressing upon you the how because this is something that you never challenge yourself to take control of. The what, you'll figure that out. The how, are you making things laws, shoulds, need tos? When you are creating the frustration, you are creating the depression, you are creating the anger, you are distancing yourself from God and then wondering why you don't feel connected? Or are you looking at things through the lens of preference? What do I want? How do I want it to go? What would I like? How would I like things to be? Now creating opportunities for yourself to really experience some happiness and joy, connections with other people, and connections with the Bible. Transform through the renewing of your mind. So week one, this is the challenge. Listen to yourself, listen to your partner, listen for should, must, have to. Endeavor to make that switch. See how much you are doing this. Week two is gonna have a different, week three is gonna have a different. But this is week one. And so this is what we focus on. So I wanna really thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, This is completely awesome. We've got two more Wednesdays and then we'll be done. <clears throat> a quick prayer to close out. Mike will hit the music. You guys will be free to go. Dear Jesus, you know, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here tonight. And Lord, you know, I pray beforehand that, that the words coming out of my mouth tonight are the words you want spoken to these people. And there are people in this room who are hurting, who are angry, who are frustrated, who are feeling lost and disconnected from you. And Lord, I... I I ask that you you impress upon them as they drive away that bit of information that you want them to get from this past hour and a half. And Lord, help them grow that seed into something larger and stronger so that they can begin to take control of their life, their emotions, and yes, begin to take control of that relationship with you. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. See you next Wednesday.